For this morning, again, Philippians chapter 3, we're going to only cover the first three verses. And so Paul writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, my, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Do you like to repeat yourself? <laughs> you, do you like saying the same thing over and over? Do you ever grow impatient? Here we go again. I have to say that again. I think uh, the truth is, I guess it depends on what the, what the scenario is, what the, the, the statement is that we have to say over and over. So for me, I'm really tired of saying, make sure you clean out the sink after you brush your teeth. <laughs> but I'm not tired of saying, I love you. I, I will always love you. You will always be safe with me. I'm not tired of that. And a whole lot less significant, I don't grow tired of teaching someone how to throw or catch or hit a baseball. I don't mind showing them the same technique and working through the same drill over and over and over again. Also, in fact, to, to those that are weary, downcast, to those that are sinners and know that they are in need of a Savior, I don't mind sharing the good news of Jesus over and over and over again. So then the truth is, or the understanding would be, if we love the person or the people, and we love the news, we love the message, then it's no problem at all to say the same thing over and over again. But if we do not love the person or we do not love the message, it's a bit laborious, isn't it? The Apostle Paul here loved the Lord, and he loved the good news of the Lord, and he loved the church in Philippi so much that he said right here in what we just read, to say the same thing to you again is no trouble to me, and it is safe for you. The Lord was worth it to Paul and the people of the Lord. They were worth it. It was no trouble to say it over and over again. And what he was saying over and over again was rejoice in the Lord. Take joy in the Lord. Enjoy the Lord. Because somewhere along the lines, this great church, this church that had partnered with him and been used, partnered with the Apostle Paul and been used by God to do great work all over. They had begun to drift away from fixing their attention on the Lord and rejoicing in the Lord. And they began to fix their attention on themselves and on the problems right there. And they began to grumble and complain and splinter and divide. Hence this letter, lift your eyes from one another, lift your eyes back to the Lord and rejoice in the Lord. You see, what, what we gather from not just this passage, but from this larger letter, and it should come up here in just a second, enjoying the glory of knowing Jesus diminishes when we look to, to counterfeit sources of hope. There's a bunch of ways to say that. And, and, and what we're getting at is when you look away from the Lord, joy begins to fade. When you begin to look away from the Lord, you are necessarily looking to someone or something else. And in the Lord, there is fullness of joy. So necessarily, when you look to counterfeit sources of joy, counterfeit sources of peace or hope or security or confidence, this, this glory of knowing Jesus, the fullness of joy realized in knowing Jesus will begin to diminish. It's true in Philippi. It's true for us today. So church... What I desire, what the will of the Lord is, is that we would fix our eyes on Jesus. And that we would know the goodness, the joy of knowing Jesus. That's where this letter is going. That's where chapter 3 is climbing to. To the, the startling reality that we can, or perhaps already we do, know Jesus. Therefore, fullness of joy is ours it's available this morning. It's available to every one of us. Now, as we walk, what he's addressing here is nothing new for himself and his ministry. It's nothing new for the church in Philippi. But it's no problem to address it again. It's, it's no trouble. That is, it's not a burden. In fact, he says something beyond it's no trouble. He says what? It is safe. It is safe for you. 
I think we would all be served. This community would be served. Our homes would be served. If we could all model the humility of the Apostle Paul. To have such a heart. To say with sincerity. It is no trouble to say the same thing again. It is no trouble to repeat my, myself. In fact, it's safe. It's beneficial. It protects you. You see, um, in, in this, in this uh, letter right here, in this particular passage, this phrase, safe for you, is emphatic. It's at the end of the passage, and it's emphatic, and it's what Paul intends for them to take away. It is safe to rejoice in the Lord. Say it another way. Rejoicing in the Lord is safe. And that's why it's a good thing to say it over and over and over again. Therefore, forgetting to rejoice in the Lord is dangerous. That, that's why the call repeatedly of the scriptures is to look to, hope in, trust in, treasure, fix your eyes on Christ. Because it's safe. And we live in a world that's dangerous. And what we need is not three keys to safely navigating through this world. We need one clear gospel message. And that's how we safely navigate through this world. Fixing our eyes, fixing our hearts on Christ. So then, Paul demonstrates great love, great humility. By circling back around and sharing, it's no trouble. And I hope every one of us here can actually believe that. That is, I hope every one of us here can believe you're not a burden. You're not a trouble. You're not a difficulty. If you are slow to believe in Jesus, you're not trouble. You're not a burden. If you are quick to forget the goodness of God, you're not a burden. If you know yourself to be a sinner and you long for a savior, but you just struggle with the same sin day after day, year after year. If you're like me and you thought by now I'd be further along. I thought I would have licked that sin by now and made progress. If you're anywhere close to being like that, you are not a burden. If you continually fall for that false identity that this world shouts out to you and you let that shepherd your heart disciple you in this world. It's okay. Jesus loves you just the same. And we're going to love you. And so don't believe the lie of your own heart or the lie of the devil that you're a burden. No, you're not. You are dear. You are precious. You are loved. You are no trouble at all. In fact, it's safe for me to say that to you. Why is it safe? Why the repetition? Why is it not a trouble to say it again? Well, we have this threefold warning that reminds us that false teachers and lies abound. False teachers and lies are relentless in this world. So then he says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. This is a forceful repetition that is intended to strike our hearts as a warning. Clear, simple declaration. This is a kind gracious warning from the Lord. So three times we read, look out or be aware, be sober minded, be attentive, be on the lookout for dogs, evildoers, those that mutilate the flesh. But what we have to also know is like the devil, these serve, these dogs, these evildoers, these mutilators of the flesh may be charming. They, they may be sweet and attractive. They may be plausible as we learn in other scriptures. You know. You know the devil is crafty. Right? And if he led with a, with a split tongue and cold-blooded uh, uh, speech, we would discern it immediately. And so he disguises himself. And you know our Lord is not the only one to send out missionaries. I hope you know that. Our enemy sends out messengers full of lies, full of slander. Yes, they sound so clever and so charming and so appealing, but all they are doing is leading some in further into destruction. And we have to be discerning. We have to be, as he says here, looking out. 
My goodness, by the time the Apostle Paul had, had wrote this letter to the church in Philippi, he had been dealing with this very issue for decades. There was nothing new happening in Philippi. He had said over and over. We know from the letter of, uh, of the church to, to, uh, in, in Galatia that some in that church had turned away from Christ, deceived, turning from their dear Lord back into this false teaching. If you've never read, I want to encourage you, go read the letter that we call Hebrews. This is the point of Hebrews. They had begun to take steps in following Jesus and the burdens and the cares and the pressures of this world were so great that now they were tempted to turn from Jesus back to this very false teaching here. And so we have that wonderful letter full of warning, full of grace. So this was not a new item that the Apostle Paul was dealing with in Philippi. He had a lot of experience with this. This was not new in Philippi either. The false teachers had been there. The false teachers were abounding. And what, what they were called, well, maybe, well, maybe you've heard this term, it's called Judaizers or Judaizers. These were false teachers that had Jewish heritage, men and women, that um, evidently had made some sort of profession of faith that Jesus Christ really is the true Messiah of God, but, and there's our problem, <laughs> but the non-Jewish followers, the Gentile followers of Jesus, had to join with them in taking on the lifestyle, the marks, the characteristic of being a Jewish follower of Yahweh. And so Jesus was not sufficient anymore. It was Jesus plus obedience and conformity to the law of God. So then in particular, what that meant, men, was if you were a Gentile follower of Jesus, you had to join with the Jewish followers and be circumcised. Oh, my word. Now, listen, I'm just going to be honest with you. It has surprised me as a pastor how hard it is to get professing followers of Jesus to get baptized. Like that's about the lowest hanging fruit we can pick in, on the, in the kingdom of God. It's sit down, lay back into water in front of people and rise with Christ, being cleansed from our sins, being united with Christ. And it's like I said, drink gasoline sometimes. And what, what blows my mind is you mean in the first century, there were grown men, 30, 40, 50 year old men that were willing to be circumcised as an act of obedience to Jesus? We can't even get people to come back Sunday night for prayer, but these people would be circumcised? It baffles me. But then I remember this. This was not really a biblical or a theological conversation they were having. Uh, history says it was it was. It was way more practical, pragmatic than that. Because I don't think any of us here, men, would sign up to be circumcised. But what if we could sign up to be circumcised if it guaranteed our safety? Maybe I'd entertain it at that point. Here's what I mean. In Roman culture, in the, in the, in the Roman Empire, there was only one Lord. And his name was not Jesus. His name was Caesar. But anyone who would not say Caesar is Lord got in trouble. Anyone who dared take the next step and said, Christ is Lord, would be severely punished. But there was this, there, there, there was this uh, maybe we would say kind, benevolent provision within the Roman Empire that any religious tradition that predated Roman rule was allowed to remain. And I hope you know, the Jewish faith predates Roman rule. And, and so then the way this works is Jews were allowed to be Jews. They were allowed to remain uh, in, their, in their practice and so forth. But Christians could not follow. Christians could not be Christians. So these Judaizers, with their false teaching, their false gospel, crept into these churches, not with this lead of you have to be circumcised you know, in, in this way to really honor the Lord, but with this lead, if you would be circumcised and join with us in this Jewish tradition, still professing Jesus, but if you would take the marks of Judaism, then you too can be safe with us. And people followed suit. Their heart was not captured by doing all to the glory of God, living for the exclusivity that Christ is Lord. Instead, it was, how do we stay safe? How do we avoid suffering? How do we get the, the military off of our back, stop ransacking our home, threatening our children, shutting down our business? Oh, all we have to do is get some skin cut off? No problem at all, because it guarantees my safety. That's what was happening. You want to be a real follower of Jesus? We got to do this thing over here and it'll guarantee safety, security. And we have a warning. We have a warning. We don't snuggle up next to this. 
We don't allow it to stay in no more than we would allow cancer just to stay and run through our body. We look out for it. We look out for dogs. We look out for mutilators of the flesh. We look out, as this says, for those that are evil doers. These false teachers, when you think about the historical context, they likely considered themselves clever. They likely considered themselves high-minded. They had discerned a loophole in the system that guaranteed their safety. But the Bible calls these people dogs, scavengers, the low life of the culture. Thinking to be high-minded, they become low-life scavengers. Trying to help Gentiles become clean to become safe, they only became unclean scavengers. These false teachers are also called evildoers. They thought they were doing good, but they were doing evil. Their wisdom, their practice, it wasn't heroic. It didn't rescue anyone. It was from hell. It was devilish. Glory. It was stealing trust from the good shepherd of the sheep. These false teachers claimed to be honoring God, but they were actually mutilators of the flesh. That is, they weren't merely cutting around. They were cutting off. They were cutting themselves off from Jesus. Cutting themselves off from the sufficiency of Jesus. Jesus, like pagans, they thought mutilating the flesh would somehow honor and gain favor with God. But hear me. They did not need mutilation, did they? They needed regeneration. And we don't need to cut ourselves to please God. We need to receive the one who was pierced for our transgressions. We need to receive his wounds as being sufficient for us. And therefore, we can join with Paul in saying, we are the circumcision. We are the people that have had our hearts cut out and been given a new heart in Christ. So he's not calling us to do more to satisfy him. He's calling us to receive all that Christ has done on our behalf to satisfy his righteous requirements. I want to say it again. I think I said this a few weeks ago, but I want to say it again this morning. Jesus plus Anything equals loss. Jesus plus circumcision, loss. Because Jesus doesn't need our help. And he didn't bring us all the way up to the finish line. And now it's up to us to take that next step through circumcision, through some act of obedience. No, it's receive what Christ has done. Jesus plus anything equals loss. But Jesus plus nothing equals gain. Life. Salvation. Jesus plus nothing is peace and joy. For them, the counterfeit sources of hope were some sort of ethnic identity, some sort of religious practice, and evidently human wisdom and human effort. And we may not say it or frame it in the same way that these, that these Judaizers were teaching there in Philippi and all over the world, but their teaching remains today, and we still fall prey to such false teaching. Consider, where do you put your confidence? What gives you peace? What gives you confidence today? Or maybe the other way of saying is, what, uh, it, when, when it's missing, causes you to have less or no confidence? If something is taken away, your peace goes with it. Your confidence, your joy, your settledness goes with it. Is it progress in the faith? That is, when you're walking with the Lord and you're bearing to bless and build up and serve. And when that one you're blessing and building up and serving is doing well, you feel really good and confident. When they begin to waver, you feel less confident in the Lord. So then your identity is in their obedience. Your confidence is in their obedience. I think one of the, one of the realities we have to acknowledge in 2020 is we've put way too much confidence in leaders. You have the right pastor. You have the right mayor, you have the right governor, the right president. Sweet. But let the pastor be a bonehead like this one. You begin to wobble a little bit. Let the, the election go the wrong way and we get the wrong governor or maybe the wrong city council or, God forbid, the wrong president or vice president. And our confidence isn't settled anymore, is it? Honestly, confession time. It has truly surprised me. How many Christians, even in our own fellowship, have based their confidence on President Trump being reelected and then going so far as saying, I know that's going to happen because God's in control. 
as if the alternative outcome means God's not in control? They won't say that, but that's how they're living. That's how they're functioning. Their heart is restless and anxious as if God was dethroned by the American voters. Where is our confidence? Maybe it's money. There's a certain line in our accounts when it's up there, we're okay. And when it dips below that, for whatever, ooh, we get restless. So I could go on and on of all the temptations and all the opportunities we have for, for confidence in anyone or anything not named the Lord Jesus. We look to all sorts of people, all sorts of circumstances for hope, for peace, for comfort. And they are relentless in their temptations, aren't they? But we have a steadfast Lord. And he gives us in his kindness this forceful warning. Look out. Always. Constantly. Be on the lookout for false claims and false hopes. But always. Constantly. Rejoice in the Lord. You see, what I'm getting at is the true, the better way of looking out for the false hopes of this world is to be so enamored with the truth that immediately we spot a lie. We're so consumed by the goodness of the truth that when a lie creeps in, we know it a lie immediately. That's what Paul is doing, and that's why he leads with this word, Finally, so then, my brothers, my sisters, rejoice in the Lord to say the same thing to you is no trouble to me and it's safe for you. And so what he's calling us here to is enjoy the truth. The way we look out for the counterfeits is by enjoying the truth, by rejoicing in the Lord. So let's read all of this again, beginning in verse one of chapter three. I want to read all the way through verse three one more time. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. This whole letter exists to impart joy to the to the people of the Lord, to this local church. And right here, you can see it with your own eyes, Lord willing. You have your own Bible that you can interact with. You can see there in verse 1, rejoice in the Lord. Now think about this. Some were teaching these brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters in Philippi. Trust yourself. Trust your effort. Trust our wisdom to navigate through this difficult time. And Paul says... It's rubbish. False teachers are going to come along and tell you to trust yourself. Trust your wisdom. Trust your goodness. Trust your intention. And the Bible says back to us, to those false teachers, that, my child, is rubbish. You see, right after, right here in verse 3, where he says, put no confidence in the flesh, he's going to go on to say, I, of all people, have reason for confidence in the flesh. But all of that is rubbish compared to knowing Christ. Look down at verse 8 real quick. The Apostle Paul said, I, indeed, he said, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So trusting personal strength, personal wisdom, personal effort is a bunch of manure. It's hogwash. It's garbage. It's filthy rags. Well, that's insulting. Isn't it? Because aren't those the very things we want to be commended for? Tell me I'm doing a good job. Tell me that I'm, I'm there for you and I'm faithful. And, and Paul is saying all of that. If anybody had a reason to boast in the flesh, it was, it was me. But now that I've done that, and now that I know Christ and I'm able to reflect on it, it's manure compared to knowing Christ. In fact, 
when we get to verse 6, I think we're all going to be startled by what Paul says there. Because he says, as to the law of God, he's blameless. Church, is it a good thing to be blameless before God? Yes, this isn't difficult, right? I mean, yes, that would be a wonderful thing to be blameless before God. But Paul says being blameless before God is rubbish compared to knowing Jesus. Do you know what's better than perfectly obeying God? Knowing Jesus. So I've got news to you. If you're a sinner, you know yourself to be a sinner in need of a Savior, Paul, the Scriptures are offering for her something better than not being a Savior and not Savior. It is better to be a sinner that knows Jesus than to be sinless and not know Jesus. Can you believe that today? And this is why we don't want to keep going back to these counterfeit sources of hope. We want to be so enamored with Jesus... That when the counterfeit comes up, immediately we say, rubbish. That's no temptation to me at all. Needing Jesus and knowing Jesus exceeds not needing Jesus and therefore not knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus is the whole point of this thing. It is a better thing to be broken and then redeemed by love than to have never been broken and to have never been redeemed by love. Can you believe such news today? That's what Paul is saying. And meanwhile, in Philippi, they're competing with each other. They're propping up their obedience. They're propping up their wisdom against one another. And Paul is saying, guys, look up. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior. Lift your eyes from the cares and the burdens and the temptations of this world. Fix your eyes on Jesus and rejoice in the Lord always. Far better. Far better than any effort, any wisdom. And so he tells us here to rejoice. Now, for many of us, and we chalk it up to personality, rejoice means some sort of inner joy and affection for the Lord, a gladness in the Lord. But in the original here, rejoice means external word of praise and singing to the Lord. And this is why I say, men, I'm about to step on your toes, but this is why I say, if you want to know whether or not God has a man's heart, will he dare humble his heart and sing glory to God? And we see churches full of women that passionately sing and men that just sit there and what they've said was, I will disobey this passage. And when Jesus has your heart, you'll sing. It may be a mumble. Because I know there's insecurity. I know there's things that happen. But when Jesus has your heart, you will give thanks to the Lord with your mouth. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And no fear will silence that mouth. And so this week of Thanksgiving, think about all the reasons you can rejoice in the Lord. Yes, this world stinks. Yes, your life is hard, but he endures forever. He does not change. We always have reason to give thanks, to rejoice, to praise the Lord. And so part of the way the devil comes along and, and, and uh, tries to control us is he bombards us with opportunities to doubt. He bombards us with opportunities to fear. And then we find ourselves focusing in on the potential outcome, the scenario. What will happen if? Focusing in on the Lord. So the positive here, or the, the command here is a positive command. Rejoice. That is, are you ready? Don't fight against the dogs. Don't fight against the evildoers. Don't fight against the mutilators of the flesh. Rather, rejoice in the Lord. Fight for a clear sight. Fight to fix your eyes on Jesus. Now, I'm curious with the question I'm about to ask you. How many of you in this now hour or so we've been gathered in this room have been enamored by the basket down by my feet with these wonderful Thanksgiving colored leaves or whatever they are? How many of you have sat there and looked and looked and looked and thought and you're like, um, are those the same ones as last year? Are they real? Are they dusty? They're crooked. Can somebody go up there and straighten that out? More than likely, you may have casually noticed. 
and quickly moved on. And you've been so captivated by the glory of God, right, that you didn't even notice. But now you're all thinking about it. Now, with the rest of our time this morning, whatever you do, I don't want you to think about this basket here with these flowers. Got it? Nobody look at this. Nobody pay any attention to this. Whatever we do with the rest of our time, do not look at this basket of flowers right here. Okay? Rejoice in the Lord. (laughs) You see... As soon as you begin to give your mind and attention to the thing you should not give your mind and attention to, you've lost the battle. This is why the command is rejoice. It's crooked. (laughs) And I didn't do that on purpose, but it would drive me crazy. And we all looked at it again, right? But what if I said, let's fix our eyes on the cross? Let's fix our heart on Jesus. Let's let's behold the crucified, buried, and risen Savior who lives and reigns forever and ever and ever, who is the Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, who is the good and faithful shepherd of the sheep, who laid down His life for the sheep, who is faithful to the end, who promised to never leave us, never forsake us. I think, most likely, All of us followed my attention there, and all of a sudden, the basket that just moments ago had our attention has still there, but does not consume us anymore because we're beholding the risen King. Don't fight against, friends. Fight for. Because the cares of this world are always going to be there. They're always going to be calling out your name. They're always going to be offering you a scenario that will consume your heart and your mind. They will call out to you to say, hope in me, have peace in me. If you can just orchestrate this, then you can be comfortable and rest. And all you've done is given yourself to that heart cycle. It's called worry. It's called anxiety. But our call is to rejoice in the Lord. Our call is to know we are the circumcision. We worship by the Spirit of God. We glory in Christ Jesus and we put no confidence in the flesh. Fight to see the Lord. And you won't give in. You won't fall for the lie of the counterfeit, of that that call for hope. And I am startled by what he says here. We. We are the circumcision. Paul is bringing all of God's people into this reality. We. That is, the Jews are not the... And we need to now go join them. Jews like the Apostle Paul. Gentiles like the church in Philippi. Like us. We are the people of God. We are the circumcised in heart. We have had our old dead hearts cut out and been given new hearts according to the new covenant promise. We and we are united with Christ. And so we are the ones who worship, the ones that honor by the Spirit of God. We don't trust in the flesh, do we? We don't trust ourselves. We Trust the Lord. We render true, honorable service to God. We worship. This word worship here is not what we did this morning at 1030. This word worship is more like live, serve. It's it's, um, what he said in 127. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Worship by the Spirit is live your life by the Spirit of God. Uh, uh, It's what Paul said in Romans 12, 1. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So we have a way too narrow understanding of worship. Yes, what we do this morning is worship. But worship is is never less than that. It's always more than that. 
worship is our whole life being in submission to God. So we worship by the Spirit. We live by the Spirit. We serve. We honor by the Spirit. Therefore, we're not retreating from the cares of this world into some private, safe, secret devotion to the Lord. Jesus and I, we're safe. We're okay to hell with the, with the world. Rather, we worship by shining as lights in the midst of a cricket, crook, cricket, Crooked and twisted generation. We worship by holding out into that dark world this word of life. We go and we reflect his love and we reflect his character. We reflect his mercy, his grace, his glory in a dark and perverted world. That's what it means by we worship by the spirit. And then he says we glory We boast in Christ Jesus, putting no confidence in the flesh, putting no confidence in ourselves. We know and we celebrate all glory be to Christ, our king, all glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing all glory be to Christ. Why? Because we trust him. We know him. We enjoy him and we follow the one who emptied himself. Who became nothing for us, taking the form of a servant. He took on the likeness of man and being found in human form. He humbled himself by coming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We boast in that one. We glory in that one. We declare the worth of that one. Our glory, our boast, our hope is not ourselves. Our glory is in Christ. Therefore, our confession should be that of Galatians 6, 14. You know, we will often ask, God, what is your will for me? Galatians 6, 14 is a good place to start. Far be it from me that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Did you know the Christian life is the cross-centered, the Christ-centered life? Are you are you day after day, even moment by moment, aware of such a reality? The Christian life is the cross centered or the Christ centered life. It's a life of making much of Jesus. Do you boast in Jesus around your friends? Do you do you remember The supreme, ultimate reason you have relationships on earth is to boast in Christ in those relationships. Not to shrink back, but to step forward holding out that word of life. And in your own way, with your own personality, ascribing glory and worth to Jesus in whatever the conversation, whatever the circumstances are. I have a friend. That is far from Jesus. And um, from time to time he has a foul mouth. That is certain circumstances arise. And out of his heart comes. Just words that are dishonoring to the Lord. And in time he noticed. That I don't join in such behavior. And what it's led to. Is now when things go south in his life. In the fun of our relationship, I'm able to swat them or bump them and say, that's why I trust Jesus right there. Because I have hope when those things come to my life. And now what I'm saying is, you glorify Jesus with your own personality. That's just one way to point a heart back to the sufficiency and the goodness of our Lord. So Christians are known for all sorts of things today, aren't they? And some are, are wonderful. And some are very curious. That's what Christians are passionate about. You ever think that? Get on Facebook. You'll learn it in a second. That's what Christians are emotional about. You know, the will of God is for us to be known for glorifying Jesus. And we're known for all sorts of things. Let's just make sure by the by the working of the spirit, we are glorifying and enjoying Jesus. What's central In your heart and your mind in these days. What is more central? Your struggle or your salvation? Your effort or the finished work of Jesus? Your safety or your Savior? Which consumes you? Which governs your day? 
self or Savior? Circumstances or Christ? This, this word is so kind. In the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the temptation to turn back because of sorrow upon sorrow. If you won't join with saying Caesar is Lord, it's going to cost you. And we could go back into our homes and begin to plan and begin to scheme. How do we overcome what the government has demanded of us? And we think, is there a loophole that we can pass through? Yes, it's called obeying the scriptures and trusting the Lord. And not being consumed by the temptations of this world, but being consumed by the Lord, enjoying him and trusting that he who promised is faithful. So then, my brother, so then, my sisters, rejoice in the Lord. And in doing so, you will necessarily be looking out for the dogs, looking out for the evildoers, looking out for the mutilators of the flesh, looking out for all the counterfeit, counterfeit hope, all the counterfeit peace. All the counterfeit joy. Don't fight against. Fight for a clear sight of Jesus. And your heart will be quieted. And you will find yourself rejoicing in the Lord.